Hi, welcome to lesson seven of Nonprofit Human Resources. This is Andrew Sears. And in this lesson, Angie Kreiner is gonna be talking about how nonprofits can um, handle a lot of the HR issues related to volunteers and interns. So um, Angie, um, in, in before Angie goes, I'm gonna just give kind of an overview of how volunteer management fits into the larger picture of human resources. So um, one basic idea is that many of the principles earlier in this course apply to volunteer management. So steps to effective recruitment and placement, having effective on orientation and onboarding support. I, I can't tell you, I used to manage like hundreds of volunteers at a time. And once I realized that I could solve like 90% of my problems by having good orientation and onboarding, that was so valuable. <laughs> so. Um, and uh, so this presentation is going to focus primarily on key legal considerations for nonprofits to consider in categorizing volunteers and interns. Um, but there's other uh, reading and material this week that's going to cover more general topics of volunteer management. So successful strategies for recruiting, training, and utilizing volunteers and developing nonprofit internship programs. So um, one of the big things is just to recognize that a lot of volunteer recruitment happens now online. Um, so the biggest websites, Volunteer Match, there's a lot of other ones out there um, that you can get. And then a lot of uh, nonprofits are moving their volunteer management to online volunteer management systems. So Volunteer Hub's a big one, iVolunteer's a big one, but um, those are two categories of tech tools to do some research on. And, you know, with the recruitment, most organizations just post on, you know, as many sites as possible initially, and then they see what works for them. And, uh, and then they, you know, narrow it down. And then volunteer management, you'd have to figure out which one you want to work with. Um, so the, I, our organization used to have an AmeriCorps program. And as a part of that, we were required to do extensive background checks on people. Um, you can do a sex offender background check for free on this website. Um, each state generally will have uh, a different background check to do state background checks, and that's going to cover um, state crimes. And then you have FBI background checks, and that will cover um, federal crimes. And often what you'll need to do is you'll need to Google a local, a local fingerprinting vendor and work with them and then have your intern or have your volunteer sign releases. Um, and there's a lot of background check vendors. Now, depending on you know, who, who the volunteers are working with, you have a volunteer that's like just working in an office and not interacting with kids, you probably don't need to do these, all these different levels of background checks, um, or you may, depends on the organization, um, depending on you know, what, what your risk is. Um, but a lot of uh, organizations will just outsource a lot of the background checks to vendors. Um, so that's the quick overview I would provide. And Angie's done a lot more um, around a lot of the uh, classification, especially if you're working with interns, you have to be careful about how you classify them relative to employees. So Angie, um, do you wanna just kind of explain some of the issues around that? Sure. Um, it is important to understand that volunteers are not employees and interns may or may not be employees. So it, it is important in terms of how things are structured and set up uh, it, and then how it's pathed. So it's like once you set up your structure and you've got your definitions, you want to make sure to path it out entirely so that all necessary separation maintains separation. So an intern is actually not a term that is very clearly defined or even commonly used within the DOL, Department of Labor, or the Fair Labor Standard Act. The question is really whether or not the intern is an trainee, an employee, an apprentice, or a volunteer. Um, and those terms are all terms that are definitely defined and used within DOL and FLSA. So we're going to talk more about that. The first definition is really that an employee, according to the Fair Labor Standard Act, is someone who performs any activities that are basically controlled by the employer or directed by the employer. The work is ultimately for the benefit of the employer, and it doesn't even matter if um, the work isn't required, if it's permitted. In fact, the law actually says if the employer suffers knowledge of. So it's definitely something that if you set up a program and the intent is that they're not an employee, that there has to be a clear, measurable understanding and um, tangible return on what they're learning or they'll end up as an employee. 
A, the definition of a trainee, according to the Department of Labor, a trainee is not an employee if these six criteria are met. One is, is that the trainee receives training, and even though it includes actual operation of the employer facilities or operations, um, they are also given training that would be similar to that of a vocational school. So learning, instruction, supervision, education. Two is that the training is for the benefit of the trainee. Third is that you can't displace a paid employee. They, um, they have to work under very close supervision. They can't just be left to run the thrift store on their own or handle all of the pickups for um, donations on their own. Volunteers can do that, but a trainee cannot if they're an unpaid. Um, the fourth thing is that an employer provides training that derives no immediate advantage from the activities of the trainees. And on occasion, um, the employer's operations might actually be impeded. So initially, a lot of people want to bring on a trainee or an intern to maximize their workplace. And while that may be true at some point to a degree, it can't become the case when if you have an unpaid trainee filling a certain role and that trainee were to go away, if you were actually going to have to hire somebody, then you want to rethink whether or not that's truly a role for an unpaid intern or trainee. So five is a trainee is not entitled to a job at the conclusion of the training period. There should be no expectation of hiring. And there should be um, a mutual understanding that the trainee or the intern is not entitled to wages for time spent in training. A volunteer is really any individual who donates or services. It's most often on a part-time basis, but many of our organizations benefit from volunteers who give more than just part-time. Um, and if it's for a public service, religious or humanitarian objective, then not as employees without contemplation of pay, then they're not considered employees of the charitable organization. And I, I'm, that's a little bit wordy. Let me try and simplify it by saying that if you have an unpaid intern or volunteers and you are a 501c3 organization, religious or not, but a, a, a charitable organization, then having volunteers and having unpaid interns is much easier than if you are a for-profit employer. If you're a for-profit employer, it gets far more complicated, but within the charitable space, it's far more common to have individuals who function as trainees or interns that are unpaid and volunteers who are unpaid or nominally stipended. So under federal law, the FLSA defines individuals that provide services without any expectation of compensation and without coercion or intimidation <laughs> as volunteers. So there's no employment relationship with the volunteers. So the vast majority of information that was set up relevant to policies, procedures, legalities, best practices, that, that are part of the employer-employee relationship do not automatically and most often do not at all transfer straight over to volunteers. Volunteers should never be given a handbook because they're not your employees. And there is a different, um, uh, there are different rules and expectations and laws that wrap around the volunteer-employer relationship as opposed to the employer-employee relationship. So you don't wanna commingle in any way the employees and the volunteers. They should not use the same application form. They should be different. They should have a different um, orientation that is specific to their role, either as a volunteer or an employee. Policies and procedures should not be identical. Now, there may be some that are shared, but the language should be rewritten so it's appropriate to the receiving audience. So for example, there's a pretty common policy that I write often for many organizations who provide residential services or community-based services to individuals. And it's uh, called Guidelines for Personal Interactions. And it, it is a policy that creates some guidelines and boundaries for interactions that are acceptable and not acceptable between staff and the individuals who receive services and programs. 
Now that policy may very well have a value for volunteers, but it should be then rewritten and adapted so that it doesn't say staff, but it says volunteer. And that should then be delivered within the volunteer handbook separate from what the staff or employee would receive through the employee handbook. Um, the other thing is that the service opportunity description really is different than just a straight up job description. Um, it may be different than a volunteer job description. So it's important to really make those things clear and distinct. Yeah, and that's a point that can be really difficult to do in practice. Um, we, we had to do this also with AmeriCorps where every time you refer, you might have, you know, the word staff in, you know, 400 different documents, um, you know, a thousand different times. And you want to reuse those documents for training your, you know, your volunteers and, and, you know, presentations also. And they actually would come in and audit us. And if they found the word staff anywhere, <laughs> it was just really bad. Um, so, you know, whatever you do, if you have an application, you need, just need to make sure that, you know, you're not calling them staff or employees and same thing with manuals and other things. And, and part of what we did is, you know, like the example you said with that policy, you can cut and paste, you can have an employee manual and have a volunteer manual and you cut and paste that policy into your volunteer manual. And then you search and replace for any words like staff or employee, and you make it clear that that's going to apply to them. So um, exactly. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about stipend and volunteers. Um, many, or I should say most, I think, charitable nonprofits don't tend to even stipend their volunteers, but some do on occasion. And there are some parameters that are put around that. Essentially, what it says is that um, some, you can reimburse volunteers for reasonable expenses. So if a volunteer is working with you on a special event and they make a few purchases at a store for that event, it is absolutely fine for you to reimburse those out-of-pocket expenses to a volunteer. That is not considered a substitute for compensation. It's to the benefit of the organization and so forth. If you're going to provide a stipend, the general rule of thumb is that it doesn't exceed 20% of what you would have to pay an actual employee for the same service. So it has to be definitively nominal is really it. There can be no competition, quote unquote, or no confusion between someone who serves as a volunteer and someone who serves as an employee. So if your nonprofit does decide to uh, offer stipends to volunteers, you don't want them to receive the same benefits that paid employees receive. Um, they really, in every sense of the word, need to maintain full separation from staff, from employees. And uh, you can't exceed 20% of what you would pay an employee. So there's an additional link that we've provided there for some um, further information related to that. Yeah, and just a few points. Um, so, you know, I actually got started in ministry at City Union Mission in Kansas City, and I was summer staff. And I still remember they paid me $1,000 um, for, for being summer staff, um, which was a lot less, you know, I, I worked a lot that summer. So um, it was definitely below the 20% threshold. Um, that was, you know, three months uh, of work for, you know, $1,000, right? Um, but part of what it, it can do and part of the reason why some organizations do it is it, um, you know, shows that you, you care to a certain extent, especially if someone's, you know, spending three months working full or volunteering full time with you. Um, but the other, it, it kind of increases the accountability. Um, so I've worked with organizations that, that do that, too, where it's just. Um, you know, whenever I was, uh, you know, doing doing the, the summer. Um, you know, I think at the time they, they probably weren't following this practice. They called us summer staff, which probably isn't right um, at the time. But, um, you know, I was expected to be there and it wasn't like, I, you know, I didn't if I didn't feel like showing up, I, I wasn't there. Um, so I think and, and that's an ex expectation that's common with volunteers. So um, mm -hmm. but that's part of why um, organizations do that. I think this next slide is mine, so I'll, I'll just talk through that. And also, this also relates a lot to AmeriCorps actually classifies their AmeriCorps members as stipended volunteers. And they have teams of lawyers that make sure that they follow all these guidelines. But, um, you know, the questions they ask 
is the work they're doing really volunteer work? So um, if it's a nonprofit, that's going to help, as Angie mentioned. Um, it should be the type of work that's typically associated with volunteer work. Um, if you have uh, someone doing something that's like highly commercial, selling popcorn at a baseball game or something, I don't know, that this typically is not done by volunteers, then it's going to be harder. Um, and compensation should just be to cover uh, basic expenses. Um, the same thing with trainees, you shouldn't displace regular employees. Uh, you, you can't have expectations of benefits or a job in the future. Um, it helps if it's less than full-time. Um, and again, you know, no pressure or coercion or expectation of employ employment. What some organizations kind of unethically would do is they'd have 10 volunteers and whoever works the hardest gets a job. That is not okay. <laughs> so, and uh, um, typically it shouldn't be involved in commercial or for fee activity. So like a thrift store. And, and I don't know, Angie, have you ever seen organizations use stipended volunteers in thrift stores? I, I would assume they'd try to avoid that. Right, right. They'll use um, volunteers unstipended yeah. to help out in certain areas, like maybe to help sort or certain things like one day a week, meet with the people. But in terms of the actual commerce type of things, they, they need employees for that. Yeah. So that becomes the other issue is it's not just a commercial or for fee, but it, it tends to, if it gets into that arena, also violate that you would have to have an employee if you didn't have that volunteer do, the, do that job. Right. And so that is displacing an employee. Yeah. And, and another one also is just not having a volunteer supervising other staff, which mm -hmm. honestly in ministry, sometimes you'll get someone who's a retiree and they're like 65 and they probably should be supervising other staff in terms of their wisdom. <laughs> but if they're a volunteer um, that's a stipend, typically they shouldn't be supervising other staff. So, right. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, you want to cover apprentice? Sure. Um, you know, apprentice is a term that was actually used quite a lot several years ago, and um, it has a nice ring to it. So I think people like that term, but the Department of Labor has a very precise definition of an apprentice and an apprenticeship program. And so I don't tend to encourage that people use that title unless it is legitimately an apprenticeship role within an apprenticeship type of program. So someone who undertakes a system of learning or craft or trade from one who's engaged in it and is paying for the instruction by a given number of years of work. The terms of apprenticeship are regulated by many labor agreements as well as, well as the law. So ones that we're most familiar with is um, electricians. If you are a, an apprentice to become an electrician, you have to receive that training from someone who's of a journeyman status and if you're within an educational apprenticeship program, it's got to be registered by the state. So it basically means that it's a worker who's at least 16 years of age, um, unless there's, depending on the level of internship is otherwise affixed. So some industries have higher wage, or I'm sorry, higher age requirements to participate. But training is provided through a structured on the job training combined with supplemental related theoretical and technical instruction. So for the most part, um, apprentice is not a great title. Intern is a great title <laughs> um, that has far less meaning under DOL or FLSA, whereas apprenticeship really is a, a prescribed title for a prescribed function and purpose. Yeah, I, I think the main situations where you might see nonprofits doing this is if, you know, like your Habitat for Humanity and you're actually apprenticing people for trades where, you know, you have to be a licensed carpenter and you're under another carpenter or electrician or something like that. That might make sense. But mm -hmm. it seems like the key thing is, is it tied to some sort of license that, you know, generally is regulated for apprentice. So, yes. So really when you're trying to figure out like, how do, I, how, can, how do I know what to call people? If the benefit is for the employer, it's an employee. If the benefit is for the individual, it very well could be a trainee or an intern. And if it's both, then it could be an apprentice provided that it's within the correctly structured and registered program and or a volunteer. So very simple matrix to run your process through. All right, so kind of taking a different tack, um, 
one of the common things that occurs in rescue missions, but also other organizations or agencies that have residents or clients or participants, whether they reside um, on site or they receive programs and services on kind of a community basis, is how to really effectively work with individuals while they're in program and then post program. So during a program, if someone comes and is part of a residential program, usually at that point when they have an assignment within the organization, the focus is on building character development, work ethic and employment readiness. And that should be what the focus is on. The other part of it should also be um, community mm -hmm. life skills. And I'm gonna talk for just a minute about that. Within rescue missions and actually within many residential programs, the reason why people reside within a program for a, a more extended period of time is because uh, that their life has fallen apart outside of it, or they have encountered a hardship that on their own, they're not able to navigate without some assistance. So one of the things that is commonly lacking, not always, but commonly, is a breakdown of effective community life skills. And one of the things that's important is that as we, regardless of our, our living situation, whether it's a family, whether we can... Um, Remember going to college, some of you guys may are in school and I don't know if you take additional courses where you are living on campus. Um, but within given communities, there are rules and expectations that are, are largely captured as community life skills. And that's one of those things that many of our people would benefit also from learning. So it's kind of the immunity community, the immediate community life skills and the larger ongoing progressive character development, work ethic and and employment readiness. Often they're called task assignments or ministry assignments, and they should provide an opportunity for residents to develop work ethic based on new character aligned with biblical principles. Obviously that is addressing the Christian ministry component. So if in fact people come through a rescue mission and they accept Jesus as their Lord and savior, and they're now learning about what God calls um, his children too, then they are working to realign the way they think with the way they act with the way they interact. And so they're trying really, when you think about it, it's an opportunity to retrain themselves from their old way of behaving and thinking to a new way of behaving and thinking. So the application becomes more broad based, not skills or industry specific. It's how do you handle um, frustration? How do you handle miscommunication? What does appropriate communication sound like? They're much broader so that they have the ability to learn those things and then as they graduate from programs to apply them as they go into the workplace. Post-program is really when we set up the type of internship or opportunity for an individual once they've completed the program who have some additional reasons to want to stay. And that may vary to some degree. In other words, um, many organizations have what is called uh, like a culinary arts training program. And because they provide food services, they also provide um, training for people that will, once they complete that vocational training, then they would be able to take those skills and attainments and look for work outside. So very commonly, it's, that would be a vocational intern. So post-program, if an organization creates an opportunity, then an individual would apply for that program and they would make a commitment towards that vocational internship. And part of that would be continued room and board, educational training. Often it involves some coursework at a local college in culinary arts. And then there are typically, depending on like the uh, American Culinary Federation would establish certain criteria that has to be met as they progress within their attainment within the culinary arts field. So laying those things out very clearly is, um, is important to a functional and a clean um, arrangement of expectation. So Angie, what I hear you saying is 
Um, you know, in calling them interns, basically you're saying interns typically are kind of a subcategory of trainee. And part of what you're saying is as a trainee, some of the things are, you know, what you call hard skills trainee. And that honestly, that's how most of the, le the, the regulations are written. But for a lot of organizations, it's the soft skills that are really the sticking point. You know, I, I used to joke with some interns, I'd say, you, you can't threaten your super your supervisor that you're going to kill them even once because you know that's <laughs> a violation and it's things that are common sense to the average person but you know they they just say well i just got angry that one time well you threatened to kill someone <laughs> you know you just right. can't do that so right. um and, and what i hear you saying is that's legitimate um in terms of you know your your training they're a training not just in hard skills but in soft skills Right, right, definitely. And depending on how hard the hard skills training is, is whether or not you offer and they select a vocational internship versus like many might have just a graduate internship where there are things that they need to learn or still resolve or address before they're really ready to go out on their own. And that would be more of a soft skills focus, although across the board, soft skills are absolutely needed. <laughs> yeah, so you would just call them an intern, not a vocational intern. You would just call them a Correct. vocational intern if it was tied to some sort of like clear career path. So, right, specific yeah. vocational training. And then otherwise, they may be a graduate intern. Yeah, got you. Depending. Okay. Yeah. Then, of course, there's also here's more types and paths like we talked about. So an academic intern is actually one of the most um, uh, established and cleanest to navigate and to path through. So an academic intern is someone that the organization would receive from an accredited college or university and the individual who would be um, serving a requisite role as an intern on your, in your, within your organization would receive academic credit from the school. And that is very clearly a benefit to the intern rather than the employer. And what you wanna do in that case is basically talk to the school or the head, the chair of the department, for example, and ask for the requirements that the school has in order to fulfill the internship. So very commonly, it would be, um, Andrew needs to serve 200 hours within a direct client role in order to receive um, credit toward his social work uh, degree, and that has to be done in the next, in the first four months of school, the first semester of school. And so you really want to kind of outline what those expectations look like and confirm that you as an organization can provide that opportunity to their academic intern. And then you want to build in a couple of check-in points along the way. You should include, like I said, the number of hours, the length of time, what they will learn, and what their responsibilities will be. You wanna define who within your organization would be their site supervisor, because depending on the type of academic intern, they may also have to have an academic professional um, supervisor as well, which often then is provided by the school. So you would have to work that out depending on the nature of the type of academic intern. Um, you also want to very much um, be sure that you have student evaluations and, and then also have those interns complete feedback for you as an organization who provides the academic intern opportunity. So those evaluations should be two way. Um, you also wanna make sure that in the agreement that you draft with the organization and the intern, that you state very clearly that there's no expectation of employment at the conclusion, nor is there any compensation if it's, if it's going to be, they're gonna get credit, but no actual um, stipend or income, so. Yeah, and we've actually worked with, uh, you know, over hundred organizations and over 600 interns over the past 15 years. And part of the reason a lot of groups partner with us is because they realize, you know, to be an intern, by definition, it has to be more serving, uh, you know, the intern than it is the organization. And a lot of organizations, you know, they say, well, how am I going to spend that much time training the intern? So they, you know, get them working in a 
some sort of situation where 95% of it is just them working and there's no training. And they, they realize there's no way I can provide that much training on site. So they essentially outsource their training to us mm -hmm. and it integrates in with what they're doing. And then we're able, you know, we have internship courses where people are able to get credit for, you know, working um, at, at their site. And, and that's, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about the City Vision internship program, but yeah, the, those are good points. And there's also a template that provides an intern agreement that, that correct going later. So, right. All right. So the second type is kind of what I mentioned a few minutes earlier, and that is the program graduate intern. And that is that at the conclusion of the program, there may be reasons why that individual is not quite ready to um, leave the organization entirely and go out on their own. Sometimes it is for vocational regions. They need to acquire hard vocational specific skills in order to really move forward um, into the next steps of their lives. Other times they may have an interest in general ministry. And so very commonly they may feel like, I may wanna make a career out of working for this organization or another similar organization. And so that becomes another type of potential vocational specific intern or one that provides them with more of a general ministry opportunity. So while it may not be as specific as culinary arts, it may be um, a general ministry kind of structured internship where they would spend time in all the different areas within a given organization in order to make additional career related decisions and moving forward. Sometimes the other thing that happens is that it's just other. In other words, there are times when individuals complete the program with us, but they still have unresolved issues that need to be addressed before they're really able to go out and find work and to successfully establish life um, on their own. And that could be unresolved legal issues. It could be financial issues. Um, I've worked with a couple of people on and off through the years who had to have uh, more serious physical medical things addressed and they needed to do it after the program, but before they actually were to go out and get some other things set up. Um, so there may be some other reasons for an individual to still need to spend a little more time. And at that point, they don't need program to the degree that they did. They're more at a, I need to take the next step of being a larger contributor while I'm still being an experiential learner within that arena. So that's not so much of a vocational, but it's more of an other. The program graduate, I think in any case, really what you're looking for is that if someone wants to participate in that post-program graduate internship, that they apply for it. The reason why is again, remember how earlier it says no coercion or intimidation? <laughs> um, best just to remove that altogether. And if somebody wishes to be part of a of a intern postgraduate program, that they apply to do so. That way it can be very straightforward. Some people have program fees, some people do not. But whatever that is, if people make the choice freely to apply for it, and then part of that application should also say, what they hope to gain from it and how long they anticipate that program to be. Because then you can sit down together and it's basically kind of a bit of a customized approach to what's the purpose of the internship, what is the anticipated length of time, define the learning objectives and the goals that are associated with it. And then also you want to define who they're responsible to. So, Again, within rescue missions, for example, there are times when an individual's in this type of internship and they are responsible to one person for ongoing program and education counseling, personal counseling related things, but related to maybe their, um, their ministry program, or I'm sorry, their ministry internship, they're responsible to a different person that is more related to the readiness sides of things. So you just wanna make sure and lay it very clearly out. You also want to be sure and include whether or not room and board is included, if there's gonna be a gratuity of any kind and whether or not there are classes required from an outside school or source. Now let's talk a little bit more about, you know, some some sort of uh, stipend or, or something you, that I know a lot of rescue missions will they'll have program graduates and then in year two they'll get um, some sort of nominal fee. Um, 
what sort of advice do you give those organizations about how to stay out of legal trouble whenever they do that? I think that when you set up this type of internship as a um, graduate option, so individuals, again, it's kind of a a post program or graduate program option, then you should stay consistent with the programming aspect of it, where individuals apply to it and they get accepted. My personal um, preference is that they use the word gratuity. There's no strings attached. It is meant to be a relatively nominal amount of money that kind of covers some of their personal incidentals, but all the major things are taken care of. Um, so room and board and, um, you know, depending on the organization, they often provide personal hygiene items, clothing items, those types of things. Right. So I think really it's more of a gratuity as opposed to a stipend. But if it is a stipend, you definitely want to follow a very nominal amount. There should, and the other thing that's really, really critical is that in no way should the gratuity or the stipend be altered to match whether or not someone shows up for the internship or not. So if someone is sick for the day and they're at home in bed, you do not reduce the amount of gratuity or stipend because they didn't come to their right. internship that day. That is something the Department of Labor will really latch on to because then it looks like productive activity equals compensation. Right. Failure to provide productive activity is a reduction of monetary recognition. So you definitely want to make sure that whatever you establish as the gratuity or the stipend is consistent for that person during the time that they participate in what was agreed upon. Yeah. And, and I know a lot of the rescue missions and organizations that partner with us, they'll pay for the, the student, the, their graduate interns uh, courses as a mm -hmm. part of, you know, that comp like, you know, support for them. So, yeah. Okay. And that's a, a very common and a very great way to do it is, you know, part of this is you'll get $50 a week and we will pay for two classes a semester from city vision toward your pursuit. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, with all interns, you've got to really make sure that you schedule training sessions. They can't just jump into the pool of busyness. They can't just have quote, on the job learning, <laughs> which is immediately throwing them into some productive thing. They really have to be able to receive some training and education um, from the organization itself as well. And you want to schedule, if they are gonna take classes from City Vision, you want to make sure and build that into their schedule as well, because that's a requirement to fulfill it. You wanna allow interns to observe into job shadow without requiring them to perform services at all times. Um, one of the things maybe, especially as they um, get ramped up into a new area is maybe the first couple of times they should literally have a pen and paper and their job is to make observations and then there's a debrief after and it should be Q and A. They should be able to ask, you know, why do we do this or not do that? Would you also do this in a situation like this? How should this be handled? So that they actually have a chance to observe and process and debrief and exchange. Um, I also think that it's really important for all interns, whatever the nature of the agreement that you have it in writing and that you keep records. Now, I wanna say this real clearly, intern records are not employee records. They're not personnel records, they're intern documents. So keep them separate from your personnel files. Conduct evaluations, again, that, that feedback is really important. If you are setting up from the beginning that there's learning goals and objectives, then you need to also set in place the, the means by which to evaluate that those are truly being learned um, and those skills are being gained. I think you also really need to train your site supervisors to work from a learning basis um, with people and that they just don't have an expectation of, oh good, this is a, another employee so that they immediately just dispatch them into a function. And really importantly, when the internship is over, end it. If the individual wants to apply for regular work with you, then, it, then when the internship is over, if it's permitted for them to do that, they have to go through an entire process of applying for work like any and every other employee.
you need to have a clear distinction. Um, so I think these are some additional guidelines whenever we work with interns that we use. So, you know, you're not required to pay interns minimum wage. De um, depending on how you're classifying them and how you're paying them, you may or may not be required to, to pay um, FICA. You should check with your own accountants and state authorities on tax guidelines. Some states may require that you pay unemployment insurance for them, um, depending on how they're classified again. And um, part of it is just saying this is kind of the et cetera. And um, you know, check with your legal authorities also on if your state requires health insurance if they're working more than 30 hours a week if they are paid. Um, so the last thing I, I would say is, so City Vision does partner with a large number of organizations around internships. If you want to work with us, so you can, it's under the partner menu, and then City Vision internships, and you just fill out that form, and then we can talk with you more about that. But uh, so Angie, this has been very helpful. So thank you for your your time on this, and um, I, I think that the, um, the the last thing that I want to cover is we have all these handouts or, or templates um, for the course. So we have a sample volunteer handbook. Um, we have a sample volunteer application. Um, we have sample volunteer policies and forms, a lot of different forms that you could use. Um, sample internship agreement and a sample intern um, feedback form. So um, you can use these as you're building your own program and hopefully these are helpful. Um, so. Thanks a lot, Angie, for, for all your you help. Bet.